Okay, Scott's here, so we can start. And um, no, wait, no. I'm I sorry for the background sound. Uh, we have the <laughs> open office format here at home. We there are two Zoom meetings going on at the same time in the same room. So I will mute myself uh, when I'm not talking. But it's um, the only times when I'm talking, yeah. and you're gonna hear um, some background conversation. I hope it's not too confusing. So um, we're gonna start off with introductions. And so Matt, it'll just um, unmute people. Um, and Absolutely, if you want to kick it off, though. Well, because because. Well, you know, yeah. So we're kicking it off with introductions now, right? Oh yeah, I'm just saying if you want to introduce yourself. Oh yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. I didn't do that. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm Lynn Dickens, you know, chair, and I'm I'm a member of the Rider Oversight Committee of the MTA. Hi, Anna Christina. Anna Christina, are you with us? Hear me now? Yep. Okay. I had to turn my mic on. I'm sorry. Um, no Anna Christina Fregoso, Boston Society of Civil Engineers. Thank you. To dealing with that. Uh, and Rue Rieker. The question of, of linear versus nonlinear relationships is. I need to circle back to Andy. Uh, Barbara? Hey, hi. Um, Barbara Rutman, Central Transportation Planning Staff, Administrative Assistant. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Chris? Sorry, um, Chris Porter, Mass Massachusetts Bicycle Coalition. Thank you, Chris. David? I, uh, yes, David Montgomery, Town of Needham. Thank you, David. Uh, I believe this is Michelle. Yes, Michelle Ho, Director of Capital Planning for MassDOT, MBTA. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Joe. Joe Blankenship, uh, Boston Planning and Development Agency. Thank you. John. John McQueen, Walk Boston. Thank you, John. Laura. Laura Wiener, uh, Watertown Planning Department. Thank you, Laura. Matt Genova. Uh, yep, Matt Genova, MPO staff. Skylar. Hi, uh, Skylar Larrabee, Boston Society of Architects. Thank you, Skylar. Scott. Uh, Scott Zadakis, I am the uh, vice chair of this group and um, uh, the executive director of Crosstown Connect TMA, and I also work for Transaction Associates. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Andrew Rieker, uh, uh, have you arrived? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. All right, uh, Andy Rieker, I'm with the City of Cambridge. I'm in the Community Development Department, and I am a transportation planner focusing on transit. Thank you, Andy. And uh, Steve Olenoff? Steve Olenoff, uh, Trick Subregion, non voting. Thank you, Steve. And lastly, uh, I believe oh, we have uh, Tanya. I think I can do that too. Um, may not be fully connected yet. Um, but I would say in the interest of time, we could potentially uh, keep the movie, go move, movie, very good, meeting going. Okay. So thank you everyone. Yeah, thanks. And, and just so you know, so, um, we, <coughs> Matt is controlling uh, the mute and unmute. And so it will make for a faster, um, it'll make it easier for you to talk if you leave yourself in unmuted. So you don't have to worry about background sounds going on in your place because when uh, you raise your hand to talk, then Matt will unmute you. Uh, and so again. we're going to do things a little bit out of order here because I want to bring up something that just recently came up in a conversation with Matt, and I want you to take it into consideration, and we'll discuss it later on at the, meet, at the end of the meeting. Be creepy, but Sue. there um, has been a request that we put the recordings of these meetings, make them available, and, and so so we'll discuss that. But but if we decide to do that, we then then at least you will have known that we're planning on doing it before the meeting. So it's not that people don't say what they intend to say, but I mean, I just don't want, I just want to remove that element of surprise uh, at the end of the meeting. So uh, that said, we're going to go 
uh, to the top of the agenda and welcome Michelle Ho, the director of um, capital planning uh, at the T. And she's going to give us a presentation on um, the CIP uh, planning process. And what I have in mind for this is to just kind of understand hey, the process with us trying to get some ideas as to where we can make um, meaningful input into the next cycle. I mean, they're going to pre be presenting the CIP uh, in, within a week, I mean, maybe in the next couple of days or so. Uh, and so we'll be able to give feedback be on the CIP as it is for this current cycle. But as you know, we, we want to be involved earlier um, in the process. So hopefully by this discussion on this presentation, we can find out where we can make more input for the next cycle. So with that, thanks for joining us, Michelle. It's all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, again, I'm Michelle Ho, Director of Capital Planning for MassDOT, which does encompass the T, but I work on the MassDOT side of the house, so I just want to be clear on that. The T might take offense if we said that I was Director of Capital Planning for the T. Um, but can I go ahead and share my screen, or are you driving? You go right ahead and share it. Okay. So let me just get into here. Um, can folks see it? Did I do it right? No, nope, I did it wrong. Hold on. Let me do this again. Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Uh, the presentation is on the screen, but it's not in presentation mode. Okay, let me put it on presentation mode. Okay, is that better? Looking good. Okay, great. So I'm going to drive it and I'm not going to see it in front of me, but um, I'm going to walk you through and to Leonard's point, talk a little bit about how you can get involved. We have received approval from the um, joint MassDOT board and FMCB to release the draft CIP that I'm going to talk about for 2021 for public comment and it is online. So I have a slide that tells you where you can find the um, CIP. But um, from a standpoint of what we do to develop the CIP, it's it's an annually produced document. Um, this year's policy document has about 3.7 billion in funding for capital transportation projects statewide for fiscal year 2021. Um, and it is a one year plan and I'll get into a discussion as, as to why that is the case this year. Um, this CIP doesn't involve the creation of a new plan. It's really a one year update to the five year plan that was approved last year by the joint boards covering uh, fiscal years 2020 to 2024. Um, the funding in the CIP covers all of our assets, it includes all of our roadways, bridges, all of our transit investments, bike and ped, aeronautics, um, the infra all associated infrastructure, and also includes the registry of motor vehicles. Um, and as I said, we have a revised direction for this year's capital plan. It's really as a result of um, what has been going on in the Commonwealth and it represents um, a what we call a one year um, maintenance of effort plan as a result of the pandemic that we've been experiencing throughout the Commonwealth. This would have been the last year of our five year um, of our rolling five year capital plan. It would have been our last update to that, which we first initiated with the production and release of the FY17 through FY21 capital plan. Um, so for this CIP, because it is a maintenance of effort, we're really focusing on continuing our investments that are already underway and those that had been already planned to start in fiscal year 21. Um, so it is consistent with all of the projects that were anticipated in year two of last year's approved five-year capital plan um, with some adjustments that are a result more of project-specific concerns rather than any budgetary issues. It does continue to maintain the priorities and strategies that we have laid out in the past for our capital investment plans to first invest in the, reli the reliability of our system, of our existing system, and the modernization of our existing transportation assets, with some targeted investments in um, increasing capacity of the network, for example, Green Line Extension or uh, South Coast Rail. Um, as well as providing access to new transportation modes, which really addresses the um, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure facility investments that we have been making over the last five years. Um, the proposed investments in reliability and modernization continue the, 
continue to represent what we have been focusing on. They represent about 73% of the FY21 programmed investments, which is consistent with what we have seen in past, past years. Um, the public review of this plan, unlike past years, will be done through six virtual regional meetings, public meetings that are gonna be hosted by our uh, MPO partners. So, um, the project spending in the capital plan for 21 is consistent with the projects that have been programmed in the five-year STIP that has been um, released. So all the MPOs have been hosting virtual public meetings to revise their tips, and we are pulling together the final draft STIP um, that has been released also for public comment. We have assumed that the Chapter 90 um, funding for 200 million will be reauthorized for fiscal year 21. We do not yet have that legislation enacted, but we assume that it will be enacted and passed in time for the FY20, start of the FY21 fiscal year, which starts July 1. We haven't assumed, because again, this is a maintenance of effort plan, any new funding sources or programs that were not previously underway. We had originally proposed a number of new initiatives on the municipal side, but we have curtailed those assumptions this year, given that we're really trying to focus on what we know to be the case uh, and available. Um, some of those new initiatives were dependent on the transportation bond bill that the timing of which is uncertain at this point in time. So we've determined it is prudent to just continue forward with what we already have planned. And then um, we anticipate that we will develop a full five-year capital plan at some point in the future later in 2020 when things, um, when the both the state and federal legislative and funding picture becomes a lot clearer. Um, overall, the structure of the CIP, as I've talked about, um, stems from three priorities. We back with the development of the first five-year capital plan under the uh, baker Polito administration, we established three priorities, uh, reliability, modernization and expansion for the framework of how the CIP would actually be built. That was different from what had been done in the past. In this, we have continued this framework with the development of the CIP, as well as also the development of the STIP, frankly. Within those priorities, we have investment programs. So, uh, for example, on the highway side, we have a program that invests in um, the bridges statewide or the pavement condition on the interstate or non-interstate pavement condition. At the T, you have a program for track signals and power work, uh, stations upgrades, facilities. So there's a number of different investment programs. I think this year we have roughly 70, 73 investment programs across all of the MassDOT divisions. And those are focused on, um, and those are aligned by priority. So there's um, within the capital plan, you'll see that there are investment programs under the reliability priority, which is really um, what we call state of good repair or the modernization category, or even the expansion category. Programs like under expansion are Green Line Extension, South Coast Rail, and the like. Within each of those investment programs, our goal has been to select the best um, projects that achieve the goals of the individual program. So in the past, um, prior to this framework that we created, the CIP was really just a list of uh, proposed projects for investment. Now, the projects are chosen that are the, that achieve the best goals for that individual program. But then finally, um, the CIP is a compilation of all of this effort, um, starting from the priorities all the way down to the project selection. For fiscal year 21, we have about, as I said, 3.7 billion in program investments. And as you can see from the, the charts, uh, the top chart is aligned by each of our divisions. And the green bar represents those um, investments under the reliability category or state of good repair, um, the blue modernization investments and the black expansion. Um, the pie chart on the bottom reflects that we have roughly 48% our investments targeted for this year in reliability investments and 25% in modernization. So there's where the 73% comes from. And the top just to raise it by division and the two bottom charts are just the aggregated 
as compared to last year. And we are comparing uh, state fiscal year 21 as was approved in the 2024 capital plan last year. So it is an apples to apples comparison. And roughly, um, as you can see, given that it's a maintenance of effort, we're basically level with last year's uh, programmed investments. So no significant change. Um, just for the benefit um, <clears throat> for, your, for your group, we, we pulled in some of the projects that are uh, reflected in this year's capital investment plan for the Boston region. I know that that would have been you know, of interest to you, some of the projects that are ongoing. Obviously, you know about the North Washington Street Bridge, um, but there are a number of other projects <coughs> that have been proposed or investments that have been proposed. Normally, this would have been a five-year comparison and we've been be pulling out a lot of different projects, but obviously, since we're focused on what projects are already underway, we've just chosen to highlight those of significance in the capital investment plan by um, either it's, if it's a roadway or bridge project or a T project or uh, you know, a regional transport, transit authority project, et cetera. So this just gives you a snapshot of what's included in the capital plan for this year. Um, <clears throat> we work very closely with our metropolitan planning organization partners. And as you know, you have a seat at the table for the Boston MPO, um, but the um, MPOs are, are, are federally required in urbanized population areas of 50,000 or more. So we have as a map that I will show you, we have 13 MPOs across the Commonwealth, but um, USDOT provides all of the federal regulations and financial guidance on the federal funds that we can program for our federal aid projects. MassDOT provides the state match for all of the federal programs in the guidance and sets the po state policy priorities and financial guidance and oversight for the statewide transportation improvement program, as you know. And then the MPOs obviously provide the planning and programming um, and selection of the individual projects using their allocated federal funds. Um, this is just a map for your benefit of all the um, metropolitan planning organizations across the Commonwealth. Ten are actual uh, MPOs or regional planning authorities in three regions function as the MPOs and those are highlighted in black. Um, so the CIP and the STIP, we've worked very close to align them starting with the development of the five-year plan with fiscal year 18 through um, 22. Um, whereas the CIP identifies all sources of funding and the uses of transportation monies available to Massachusetts, the STIP focuses just on the federal aid program for highway and transit. So the STIP is really a subset of the CIP it's a significant portion of our CIP, roughly 40 to 60 percent is federally funded projects, um, but the CIP does encompass more. Also, the STIP, unlike the CIP, is subject to federal regulation, but we've worked closely to make sure that we incorporate all of the projects um, funded and programmed by the MPOs as well as on the statewide side into the development of the CIP. So all of the projects that are currently in the draft um, TIPS and STIP are already been captured in the draft CIP that is available for public comment. Um, this chart just shows how we have over time throughout the year as we develop the CIP align um, the STIP projects and the STIP process with the CIP projects to make sure that we are capturing all of those investments and all of the issues that are important on either on the federal aid program side or on the CIP side that we're in alignment. Um, so there was a question at the beginning of how can you get more involved? When can you get involved in the CIP? So there's a lot of opportunities for public participation in the development of individual projects, um, specific uh, modal planning studies. Um, obviously, we have had a lot of planning studies, corridor planning studies that folks have participated in with the development of the bicycle and pedestrian plans. There, were an ex there was an extensive outreach and public engagement process. Um, East-West Rail study is one study that's recently been in the <clears throat> underway 
you know, obviously there was a lot of public participation, a lot of public comment on um, that effort. We did with the Cape Cod Canal study. Um, we've done on the regional side, the commuter rail visioning planning effort and it, all of these involve opportun present opportunities for significant public participation and obviously involve significant outreach on our side, on the MassDOT and the MBTA side. And there's a lot of project specific planning um, that goes. We obviously produce two major investment plans, the capital investment plan, as well as the statewide transportation improvement um, program. Those involve public participation and um, public participation is welcomed on those plans. And then finally, obviously, as we put together the draft CIP um, uh, out there on the street for public comment, we encourage the public to participate either on an individual project, um, propose a project, or just provide a general comment overall. But there are opportunities to participate all the way through the process and at different points at time. Um, as I said, we have six virtual public meetings that have been scheduled and they're gonna be held in collaboration with the MPOs. Um, um, I've listed the, the set of six that are gonna be starting next week with um, the first one, um, Cape Cod. Um, there is a link to uh, the comp to the um, uh, the sites you can go onto the MPO sites and get a link to the public meetings that will be hosted uh, and anybody can participate and just sign on much like we're doing today um, we'll take comments on the CIP either individual projects uh, in that particular region or any project um, that has um, any project in the CIP at all, or any comment in general. Um, we do have an online comment tool that has been revamped for this CIP. And um, it allow, has quite a, bit, a few search capabilities. You can search by a MassDOT division, a municipality, an MPO region, a particular CIP program that you're interested in, say the bridge program for highway, um, you can look at cost, you can add, put in your own um, address, um, you can search for a project by name. Um, we did a lot of work in response to comments that we had received last year um, from the public. So as you can see, even a tool like this can be revamped based upon input as to its easeability, ease of use, and, um, and we've made, we've hoped that this effort this year will be uh, something that the public uh, embraces. But um, this is available. Um, the link for where it's available is listed on this presentation here. Um, and uh, we'd be curious to think, to get feedback as to what people think about the public comment tool when they've had a chance to test it out. Um, so the mass.cip is available on the mass.gov website um, at the email address listed here. You can comment either by email, letters directly to us, or directly in the document using the comment tool. And we appreciate any feedback that you're willing to provide. So I am happy to take any questions. Y yes, David? David, do you wanna go ahead? Sure. Um, I just had a question about there was one uh, chart in which you um, showed sort of a circle within circles. Uh, and you explained that the CIP, yeah, there we go, um, includes the, the other elements. And then you have a comment tool that I gather uh, covers all levels of everything in, in the largest circle. Yes. Yes. So so do you end up in a situation where you've got projects that are really kind of um, in somebody else's domain that you've, you've uh, as a matter of making it easier for the public to understand, you've included it in, in the CIP, but it's, do you end up with comments that, are, that need to go elsewhere to be processed? We do sometimes get comments that do need to be processed. Some of them might be related to operations or services that we provide and we just distribute those comments to the appropriate division. Obviously for the MPOs and the federally funded projects, we actually encourage 
uh, most of the comments to go through the TIP process for the, at the individual MPOs level so that they get recorded with the TIPs. But we will take any comments on any project, so uh, or anything about the you know transportation in general, even if it's not a capital project. Right. I'm just wondering if, as a matter of process, in terms of we we are so often focused on what is the MPO's public participation process, and then uh, is it possible that there's a substantial amount of commentary coming in through your avenue here that where we should be aware of in ways we're not? Well, um, actually through the MPO process, because we obviously work closely together at MassDOT, I work closely with the MPO team. So we make sure that if there's any comment that comes in on a federal aid project, that they we make sure that they also know about that comment in case that they need to reflect that in the tip and the final STIP documents so that they report back to Federal Highway that they've addressed the comments or that right. they've recorded them and back to the individual MPO that it refers to. Right, so we work closely together to look at all the comments on the planning side. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? I mean, we do hope people can um, take a look at it. I can pull it up if you want. I can go in and go to mass.gov and pull it up and share it. But it's actually, we've revamped the story map, obviously, because um, it is a story map that's online and there's a PDF version that you can also download. Um, but uh, we hope that people find it um, friendly to use. Um, and obviously because we're only focused on one year this year until we, until we um, know better what's happening in the Commonwealth and at the federal and state level, um, then we will do the full five-year plan. But it was the most prudent thing for us to do right now. Great. You know, Andrew? Yep, um, so thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if there was any resource we could take a look at to just see what the universe of projects considered for this um, CIP. Um, I do think that the city of Cambridge has a longstanding um, uh, question and concern about the bridges over the Charles River that on our side of the municipal boundary are known as the Western Ave and the River Street bridges, which kind of form the box of um, the uh, river parkways and um, uh, city streets. And so, you know, I, I don't see that on the, the CIP. I, don't, I forget if it was included last year, but it's kind of been this long standing kind of question for us is where are, are those projects? Um, they were previously in the accelerated bridge program. They fell out as the last few bridges to be replaced. And so we're, we're just having some difficulty in just keeping track of those projects. And so, um, you know, kind of coming from that place, also wanting to see what the universe of projects are. Yes, well, there is a universe of projects that's available on the website. So they, it's as an appendix is the full list of um, projects that are programmed in the FY21 CIP. But as I said, because this is a maintenance of effort given quite the uncertainty we have both at the federal and state level as to funding um, and, and authorization language, um, we are not undertaking, we're not really programming any new projects in the CIP. So um, I have not seen, I have not gone through every single project in the CIP in detail. But if they were not programmed last year, um, they weren't, they are not programmed for this year, for 21, until we revisit the five-year plan, which we will be revisiting a little later on um, this calendar year. Cool. Um, yeah, I think just finding out where that universe is helpful. So if there are projects like that that have fallen off, it'd be good for us to be able to then advocate like, you know, hey, don't forget about these projects. They're quite important to the city in particular. Thank you. And that's where it's important to participate and go to the CIP and submit a comment and just to make sure that we keep it on the radar. We are well aware that there's a lot of initiatives out there that folks are, have advocated for in the past. And Though we started out this year optimistic as to what we would be programming in the capital plan over the five years, we had to obviously reset our expectations when the pandemic hit. And, um, you know, we're, we're just reflecting the reality of the situation now. Um, 
that's ongoing in the Commonwealth. Um, transportation revenues, as you imagine and read about in the paper, are down. Okay. Um, it looks like um, I, I guess Andrew's finished. I think, I think, so, John, if you weren't Andrew, please raise your hand again, okay? I mean, things with low fold change. You're unmuted, John. Just not. Bill, no, thank you very much. A lot. Of very good. Um, question In terms of our ability as the advisory council to uh, be involved in the process anywhere along, uh, is it, as it seemed in the presentation, us as individuals, as the public? Or can, are we able to um, form something as, uh, as our body being part of the MPO? Well, as part of the MPO, obviously, you have an opportunity to influence the CIP because you're influencing the TIP, um, the Boston MPO TIP. So uh, that's one way to be involved. We have not done as robust an outreach effort this year, given all the basically because everybody was a stay-at-home advisory, so there, there wasn't as much, outreach done at, as much outreach done earlier this year as we had hoped would be initiated. Um, um, it's just the reality we are faced with, um, but definitely through the MPO, you should advocate for projects that you want to see funded. If they are federally eligible, obviously the avenue to advocate for those are through the MPO. If they're a state project, not funded, but not eligible for federal aid, then um, um, that's a different story. Then that would, you would advocate through the CIP process. As individuals of the public? You can do it as individuals. You can also do it as an organization and submit a comment. Not a problem. And so. Thank you. Um, I have some statistical. Anyone else? Methods. For All right. Well, I have some just as a, oh, oh, no, I, sorry, Lynn. I just want to say as a quick reminder for folks, um, yeah. if you are not aware of how to raise your hand, if you go to the bottom of your screen and press the participants button, that will open a new menu. And at the bottom of that, there is the raise hand button. Just want to make sure that anybody who has a question is being heard. Sorry, Lynn, didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh, no, no, that's good. Those Thanks for, for, for bringing that up. I mean, yep. so uh, one of us should make that announcement at the beginning of each meeting. Uh, so thanks. Uh, so um, so um, um, a curiosity question. Uh, if you're familiar with the other MPOs, me, uh, how, do they all have advisory councils like the boss, like Boston has, like us? Oh, I'm, you know, that's a good question. I'm going to have to defer to Brian Pounds to get back to you all on that because honestly, I do not know the answer and I don't want to misspeak. Okay, fine, fine. So I'm going to hold off on the rest of my questions because I have like three more maybe. Uh, but Anna Christina, um, just raise your hand. Uh, just really quickly, I'm just wondering like these special dollars. I understand the MPO is um, planning to cover overages from last year's for this year's projects um and they move 13 projects out what the, like the federal dollars are those secured already are those committed so the way that it works because the stip that actually is produced is a five-year plan per federal uh regulation so um we will commit to funding to providing the state will commit to providing the match for the stip pro, stip funded projects when we do the five-year plan you'll see that match um, obviously, this is a one-year plan, so all the state match for all the programs that were programmed that would show spending in fiscal year 21 have the state match associated with them. We're not showing all the five-year plan on the MassDOT side, only at the fiscal year 21. Okay, and just really quick, me, my last question, I'm not sure you can answer it, but I believe I heard the governor say that there was a rainy state fund of a... Uh, or rainy day fund of two billion, would it get pulled from that if, for some reason, things continue to kind of snowball out of control? That'll be a discussion that we'll have with the Executive Office of Administration and Finance when we start to look at how, uh, when we start to pull together the capital plan for the five years. We work very closely with the Governor's Finance Office. Um, when we build our capital investment plan, um, they provide the guidance on what is the state uh, funding available to us, and then we work with the, within those guidelines and those targets that they provide to us. 
So it'll be a um, effort that we look at with them as to where the funding comes from. I will point out most of the state funding that is in the capital plan, if it's not mass dot generated and it comes from the Commonwealth, it comes in the form of bonds, either general obligation bonds or state obligation or special obligation bonds. So those are bond funds. So it's all dependent on the bonding capacity of the Commonwealth and what they think that they will be issuing on an annual basis. Okay, thank you. Those aren't, that, that doesn't, I, I don't know how, I'm not sure that the stabilization fund or the rainy day fund comes into, um, that's more for covering the budget rather than covering the, the bonding. But again, the debt service is paid from the operating budget, so it's sort of intertwined, but it's not really a question that I have a good answer on. Okay, thank you. Um, I will point out for everybody's benefit that the public comment period will close on June 1. So if you do wanna make a public comment, we'd appreciate it by June 1. Are there any other questions? Oh, I'm back, hey, so, so um, can you go to the, the schedule? There's a, uh, there was a slide where you kind of showed the, the um, CIP process and the David, next one, maybe. Yeah. So what I saw. Yeah, one? that one. Yeah. So see, there, there is a point where we're looking at the, the universe and we're trying to decide what to uh, advance out of it. And there's this, this question, like, well, what is the state doing? You know, because we kind of want to figure out what the, the state is doing. Um, I mean, with uh, so you're looking at whether you, from the MPO standpoint and the, um, and the statewide project standpoint, that gets that gets sort of so I had February March time frame. We start to look at what those projects are, both on the statewide yeah, side yeah, and on the of, MPO of, side. Uh, right, right, and and so I guess it was David. I, what for me is like I kind of want to be in. That process, kind of understanding what it is that the state is selecting Actually, among what projects is selecting among the so because what it selects can have a bearing on what we do and and so, um, and so if we can understand what the state has as options, we, then even though it's not part of the formal comment process, we, by whatever means, we we can maybe say, well, this is what we think might be a better selection of programs because given the what the MPO. We can do with federal funds. I mean, it would make for a more comprehensive, more continuous you know, program. You understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, I do. And, and that's something that gets coordinated with the highway division and our metropolitan and our MPO liaison team working with the individual MPOs. But that's something we can bring up as to, you know, more coordination on that. And, uh, yeah. Timing yeah. of the statewide projects that are being programmed, I can bring that comment back. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, if, if we as the RTAC we can be more aware of what's going on there, uh, because I mean, what I find is that there's nothing quite like putting yourself at the table to make you understand what's going on better. There's just something about having to interact that makes you understand better than having it presented to you or having it told to you, well, well we've done this. So these are the projects that we think will, will, will be best on the state side. And so now we have added MPO, the program away on the federal side. So, so great, I appreciate you doing that. Uh, and let's see, let's see if any of, oh, John, John has his hand up and I can then find my question again. Uh, to your point, Len, um, and to Mich Michelle, it would be helpful for us to really have that access to the statewide because it, when we're going through the TIP, for instance, it would explain more of why uh, the Natick Route 27 project was dropped entirely from the TIP, but then it go, it's, it's not dead because it showed up on your CIP. As yes. A, as a program. Okay. So uh, I mean, I'll bring it up with Brian. I mean, I, I don't know the whole process um, of how that gets coordinated. I'll be honest. Um, I'll, I'll mention it to I'll mention it to the MPO team. On All right. Thank you. Thanks, and I think it's just going to be uh, one more from me. Uh, and 
That is so, so how is going to, how is the process going to differ next year? And I know that's a hard question because I know a lot of it's going to depend on, on how COVID um, un, unfolds me. And if you really can't go there because there's so much uncertainty, then I'm not going to ask you to speculate. But what I'm really getting at is that this was going to be the last plan where you did the rolling five year and then you were going to do like a five year plan. So let's assume that we, we were going about things as we were before the pandemic. How would the process have differed from what we're doing now? So I think what the, the obviously this year is a one off case. So next year, I, I think what the secretary has stipulated or have we discussed is that she would like to do a reset plan starting earlier in the fall. Um, where we actually start the CIP planning process earlier. Federal about, surface uh, transportation um, light authorization is needed also because you know the last act expires September 30th. So we are not 100% certain what the new reauthorization language will look like on the federal side, as well as what will be included in the stimulus bill that we expect the new recovery bill coming out. Um, and then we need a new transportation bond bill. And we've been working with the legislature and the Executive Office of Administration and Finance on the new five-year transportation bond bill, um, as well as what authorizations we may need just uh, next year in case the bond bill gets delayed much past the spring. We don't really know the timing of that legislation. So I think there's a lot of uncertainties, but I think come the summer, We'll start to get a better sense of what's happening, what the recovery looks like throughout the Commonwealth, and have a better chance of starting to think about come the fall, um, a new five-year capital plan. That was the intent. I mean, obviously things could still change and I'm not really you know, in the driver's seat on what we end up doing, but it will be in discussions that we will be having over the summer when we're all able to go back to work in the office. Yeah, I hear you. Well, well, thanks a lot, and, and we'll be checking back with uh, you and or um, Brian in, uh, in the, the early fall. Uh, so this was really helpful, and uh, uh, it gave me a, gave, gave me a lot to think about. Hopefully, the rest of the group. And so, so once again, I mean, um, extend my appreciation to Brian for making um, you all available, and thank you, Michelle, for coming and spending time with us. And I'm assuming that we can get this presentation right. Yeah, I actually sent it to Matt. Oh, and, and, and maybe. So Matt has it. Okay, great. Yes, so I can share that with everybody after the, after yes. the meeting. Excellent. Yes. And right. June 1, everybody, for public comment, that's our deadline. So please feel free to go online to the mass.gov CIP website, take a look at the plan and the appendices of all the investments, um, and they're sorted by division just to make it easier. So, um, and we look forward to speaking with you again. Thank yeah. you so much for letting me uh, present. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, right. Michelle. All right. Bye now. Bye. Yeah. And Matt, maybe uh, you can r remind the group, because right now I'm not really taking notes. I mean, and so I just know how it is with me that it's a good idea. And then at the end of the meeting, I'm going to go like, what was that good idea? <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> thank you. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so I guess we're now going to go to uh, the, the tip. And so, Matt Genova is on for uh, 20 minutes, but I think Matt's just here as a backup okay, because we're really going to talk about uh, our our um, plans for our comment letter. And and so if there are questions that Chris or anyone on the 3C committee can't answer, then then um, Matt will will chime in. And, and well, I, so I, I, have, uh, I believe that Matt does have uh, a yeah, preliminary uh, slide deck to share with people uh, just to frame the conversation. Okay, fine, fine, no problem. So um, looking at Matt, you're up, thank you. Uh, thanks, Len. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I can make uh, make the talking points uh, fairly quick here, uh, so that we can get to the conversation. Um, but I do, you know, I know in previous meetings I've talked sort of specifically about the regional target stuff, but I do want to zoom out and um, give you all a full picture of of the the full tips. So that includes, you know, the statewide uh, highway program and the MBTA and RTA program. Um, so I'm going to um, jump in and do a screen share here. Um, so let's see. Uh, can everyone see that? 
Yeah. Okay. Cool. Got a thumbs up. So looks like we're we're good. Uh, yeah. So here to talk about obviously the the Boston Region MPO tip. Uh, so uh, yeah, Michelle's presentation is a, is a really nice um, sort of even bigger picture uh, kickoff for this. Um, as you heard, um, you know the the CIP includes not just what's in the Boston MPO tip and not just in the compilation of tips across the state, otherwise known as the STIP, um, but also the, the state funded, um, the purely state funded projects. So that uh, really is the, the biggest picture and now we're, we're zooming in a little bit. Um, so this is the ground I'm gonna cover today. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, the goal is really just to outline um, the, you know, uh, allocation of, of all the federal funding in the region, um, which again includes uh, statewide uh, prioritized projects, uh, MBTA and RTA projects, and then also projects that are funded by the MPO. Uh, and then obviously to have a discussion afterwards and help you all uh, formulate some comments. Um, there we go. Uh, so I just want to remind you all of sort of where we are in the timeline for the tip. Um, so at the end of April, uh, the MPO uh, approved the draft tip uh, to go out for public review. So we are in the middle of the public review period right now. Uh, and that period ends on uh, the 21st of May. Uh, so in a little over a week. Um, we're very much in the home stretch. Uh, and then the next steps from here, that really we are going to aggregate all the public comments uh, after May 21st. Uh, and then there's an MPO meeting on May 28th where we will present the public comments have a discussion uh, about them with the board. Uh, and then hopefully at that time, uh, pending any changes the board wants to make, uh, they will vote to approve the plan. Um, and then from there, the, the tip would go into effect, uh, the start of fiscal federal fiscal year 2021, uh, which is October 1st of 2020. Uh, so I did want to flag uh, a couple of updates that we've made uh, to the actual tip document itself, just to help you uh, sort of way find uh, through the document. Uh, so if you've already taken a look at it, uh, sort of the long form PDF uh, on our website, uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate your time on that. Uh, um, it was certainly a lot of hard work that involved uh, almost 20 different staff members at CTPS. Um, so it's quite a team effort. Um, and so uh, it's a great opportunity to say thank you to all my colleagues. Um, for all their hard work on this. Um, it's, it really takes a village to bring the, the whole thing together. Uh, so we appreciate any time you spend with, with the final reports. No, um, I, so I, I just I, want to I jump in here, Matt, and say hey, I love the cover. I wanted to say it at the MPO meeting, but I didn't want to like, take the time to do it because those meetings are long enough. But I love the color, the color scheme and the, and the, the, the logo. It's just so tight. You know, it's, really, <laughs> it's really very well done, in my humble opinion. So. All right, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Len. No, I mean, really appreciate that. Uh, our graphics team um, works, you know, really, really hard on this. Uh, and we really tried to make the color scheme align with uh, Destination 2040, the most recent long range plan, um, sort of reinforce the idea that both the TIP and the UPWP are the implementing documents uh, for the long range plan. And so, um, and yeah, it works with the charts and everything. It's just, it's just so well done. It's very well done. You know? <laughs> so I really had to resist saying something at the, at the MPO meeting, but I can't resist here. So it's, yeah, it's no worries. <laughs> uh, I mean, we certainly appreciate the positive feedback and I will, right. I will pass that along to our, our graphics team. Um, cause yeah, I mean, their, their hard work on this is, is very much appreciated. Um, yeah. And on the, on the charts, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, one of the changes we made this year was to expand um, the executive summary a little bit uh, to add some more charts and tables and to really make clear uh, upfront uh, some of the investment decisions that were made. Um, yeah, so that content is just magnified a little bit more in this year's tip, uh, which we hope is useful. Uh, and then finally, I did want to flag that uh, we do have a new chapter six this year, uh, which is a chapter on equity. Uh, so this information was formally included mostly in chapter four, which is our performance uh, performance measure chapter. Um, but because that chapter is already really dense with quite a bit of, of great information, um, lots of tables and charts if you if you want to take a look at it. Um, and thanks to, to Matt Archer on this call for um, for all of his work putting together chapter four because that was a huge lift. 
Um, but chapter six really pulled some of that equity information out of chapter four so that we could highlight it a little bit more directly, um, just given the centrality of, of equity in all of the work that the MPO does. So we wanted to emphasize that um, in the actual document itself. Um, all right, so with that, uh, I'm going to dive into uh, sort of the, the big picture overview uh, of this year's tip, and then I'll drill down at the end uh, with a reminder on the actual MPO funded projects. Um, so uh, this is uh, the tip in sort of its, its largest form. Um, so uh, there are about four and a half billion dollars of, of federal funds allocated in the Boston region um, over uh, fiscal years 2021 through 25. Um, so you can see here 538 million of those dollars are funds that the MPO actually has direct uh, agency over. So those are the funds that, um, you know, we get to actually program projects with. Um, and obviously that sort of, you know, what we typically focus on the most uh, in our discussions together. Um, but you can see here that MassDOT also has quite a bit of funding, uh, a little over $850 million over five years. Um, CADA and Metro West, uh, the two uh, smaller RTAs in the region, uh, have a little over $28 million in federal funds. Um, and then the MBTA has a little over $3 billion in funds. Uh, but the picture is a little bit more complicated because some of it includes uh, financing. So it's not all purely uh, federal, federal uh, formula money, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and these figures do include uh, all the state and local matching funds. So this is really like the, the biggest picture um, for federal funding in the region. Uh, so I'm gonna break it down a little bit by agency. Um, so this is MassDOT's, uh, a summary of MassDOT's uh, statewide prioritized projects, um, or rather sort of programs. Um, so you can see, you know, they. Uh, much like the MPO, MassDOT has uh, different programs uh, funding different project types. Um, and so, you know, they cover everything from bicycle and pedestrian projects uh, to interstate pavement repairs. Um, and again, uh, MassDOT has roughly $852 million over five years, uh, and they've funded 64 projects uh, in the region with that money. Um, so again, there's sort of a broad range of projects in here. I'll flag, um, you know, some different types of things that they're funding and different examples. Um, at the smallest scale, uh, MassDOT uh, has their Safe Routes to Schools program, um, which, you know, is included in this, this big picture here. Um, they also have, you know, notable bicycle and pedestrian projects, uh, things like the, the Ponset River Greenway in Boston and the Mass Central Rail Trail, which is in Sudbury and Wayland. Um, at a slightly larger scale, uh, yeah. see a fist bump there, um, very exciting. Uh, yeah, so they're funding uh, several, several bike and ped projects on the, on the statewide program. Um, moving slightly larger in scale than that, uh, MassDOT also is funding important safety and intersection projects in the region, uh, including things like the reconstruction of Broadway in Chelsea, uh, which is again a project that we actually looked at for regional target funding. Um, but then MassDOT went ahead and funded with, with state money. Um, you know, Len, this sort of gets at uh, your question earlier about, um, you know, that interplay between when MassDOT is choosing projects and when we're choosing projects and sort of who knows what and when. Um, yeah, so that was uh, Lower Broadway in Chelsea was an example where MassDOT gave us a heads up uh, in February that they were looking at that project pretty closely. Uh, and then confirmed with us in March as we were talking about MPO funding um, to, that they were actually gonna propose it for, for funding on the statewide side. Um, so we definitely have quite a, quite a number of those conversations to make sure that um, you know, they're giving us a good sense of, of what they're looking at funding with, with state, uh, statewide dollars. Um, yeah, so a couple of other highlights here, uh, you know, MassDOT takes the lead on, on bridge funding for, for the Commonwealth. Um, and you can see quite a bit of their program here uh, is, is in bridges. Um, so yeah, I think Michelle noted that they're funding the North Washington Street Bridge uh, here in Boston. 
um, but they're also doing uh, bridges, you know, a little bit further out from, from the center of the region, uh, things like the Route 107 bridge don't actually kick you out. Um, over the Saugus River in Lynn and Saugus. Um, and then finally, you know, MassDOT takes, takes the lead on the really large scale uh, highway and interstate projects. Uh, so the projects that the MPO has largely moved away from funding, um, in large part because of the, the cost of them. Um, they're just so large that they would take up in many cases, you know, multiple full years of MPO funding. Um, and projects that fit that bill are, are things like the I-90 and 495 interchange in Hopkinton, um, as well as the lion's share of the rehabilitation of Sumner Tunnel in Boston. So before, before you move on, Matt, so you, gave, yeah. you talked about how the MassDOT said that it was going to take one project. And, uh, uh, so do you know what the rationale uh, was that, was, was behind that? I mean, I'm just trying to understand why, when it, it is that Mass decides well, we're going to take the project versus um, we would like the MPO to um, think about programming it. Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. Uh, I think it largely depends, uh, I mean, sort of at baseline, of thing, it really depends on uh, uh, how much shoulder. funding MassDOT has available in, like uh, in any given program. Yeah. Uh, so in the, using the Broadway project in Chelsea as an example, um, <laughs> there are several crash clusters on that corridor, um, yeah, both yeah. Uh, auto crashes, but then also bicycle and pedestrian mm -hmm. crashes. And so uh, MassDOT, you've, you've been in way too given long, the David. concentration of, of safety issues there, uh, MassDOT was looking at it for funding through their, their safety program. Um, and they had the funds available for it. Um, so that's an instance where uh, like, I have conversations with um, the safety program manager at MassSOT and he's like, hey, we know you're you know, evaluating this um, at the MPO level, but you know, we have some safety funds on the statewide side. So you know, we think we're gonna, gonna do this because it's a really you know, high priority for the state. So the state has a, a pretty in-depth uh, you know, project prioritization process, uh, which uh, John Bouchard talked about at, um, at an MPO meeting a couple of weeks ago. And um, so that's really where they start. It's like, what are their priorities and what funding do they have available? And then, you know, they take a look at, are any of the priorities that they have flagged for near-term funding uh, overlapping with projects that, you know, are being looked at at the MPO level? Uh, and then they usually reach out to us and we're like, hey, just a heads up, like we're looking at this project or that project. Um, and so like the Neponsa River Greenway in Boston is, a, is another example of that, where we scored that project last year um, and considered it for MPO funding. Uh, but then MassDOT was also simultaneously looking at it um, for statewide bicycle and pedestrian funding. Um, and that was a sort of high priority connection for them. Um, and so they went ahead and, and used some of their funding for it and then just, you know, let us know that um, we didn't have to use ours, uh, which is great. So we, you know, we were able to fund something else. So one more quick question, uh, yes or no, and we can move on. Do they yes. score the same way um, their projects that, that uh, you all do, we, we do for our projects? Uh, no, they have their okay. own system. Okay, fine. Yeah. Right. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, but all, all good questions. I hope that clarify some of the interplay. It's certainly not perfect, you know, I mean, it just involves a lot of communication. Um, but uh, yeah, but I think generally we, we end up in a good place. Um, so yeah, uh, moving now to the MBTA programming. Uh, so as I mentioned, the MBTA uh, has, um, you know, sort of the, the lion's share of federal funding for the region, um, but it's not all in what are called formula funds. Uh, so you can see here in this table, um, there are you know, several different categories of funding. So on the left side here, the 5307, all the way down through uh, 5339 are what are called formula funds that the T um, typically gets you know, year to year based on things like population in the Boston region, the size of the service area for the MBTA, et cetera. Um, and so these are allocated from FTA, the Federal Transit Authority, um, you know, or Federal Transit Administration, uh, down to uh, the MBTA. Um, and the same process happens with the, the regional transit authorities, uh, CADA and Metro West. 
Um, so that's sort of the top several lines here. The bottom two lines of this table um, are not formula funds, um, but they're more sort of project specific, uh, like one-off um, allocations. And so you can see here the, you know, the green line extension, which is obviously a, a project specific pot of money um, that comes through uh, FTA's uh, capital investment grants program. Um, and so that funding will obviously, you know, that's been in the tip for several years, but it's winding down now because 2021, um, the first year of the tip is, is the final year of, of funding allocated to that program, uh, both for statewide funds through the MBTA and then also for uh, MPO funds as well. Um, so we're all looking forward to that project wrapping up at the end of 2021. It's very exciting. Uh, and then the, the bottom line on here uh, is similar. Um, the RRIF funding, uh, which uh, I was not myself an expert on prior to this and still am not an expert, but um, so that's something called a railroad rehabilitation and improvement financing, um, which is a low cost loan program through USDOT. Um, and so that's funding uh, the MBTA's positive train control uh, program uh, for the commuter rail. And you can see here that um, you know, a significant portion, almost a third of, of the MBTA's five-year program is, is that low, low interest uh, financing. Um, yeah, so sort of a highlight of, you know, um, or sort of, you know, the big picture of the MBTA programming. And then I'll just say, you know, that uh, federally funded projects are a lot of the sort of, uh, you know, projects that everyone is familiar with. Uh, with the T, uh, you know, things like the acquisition of new green line cars, uh, new bi-level commuter rail coaches, uh, improvements to signals on the red and orange lines, um, and a lot of station improvements, uh, things like the Harvard Square Busway or the Forest Hills Station. Um, so a lot of the sort of top line projects that, that folks would be familiar with um, are included in the MBTA's uh, federal program. Uh, Moving briefly to uh, the RTAs. So um, obviously their funding is, is much smaller, just $28 million over five years. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of the same types of projects are funded by the RTAs. Uh, things like the purchase of new buses uh, and improvements to uh, facilities like the Blandon Intermodal Term Terminal in Framingham. Um, so sort of, um, you know, similar types of projects to the, to the MBTA, just uh, on a much smaller scale. Uh, and then I do want to highlight just the, the regional target programming, programming uh, so the, MB, the MPO funded projects. Um, so this is similar to uh, a graphic that I may have showed uh, last presentation, but I just want to sort of re-highlight it here. Uh, so again, the MPO had about $538 million over five years. Um, which includes both the 80% federal funding and the 20% state match. Uh, and you can see here, uh, you know, that we've allocated almost half of our funds to complete streets, uh, which, uh, and then smaller allocations to major infrastructure, intersection improvements, et cetera. Uh, and then just one thing to note um, that uh, the MPO did choose to leave 0.2% of five-year funding uh, unprogrammed, uh, which is about $1.2 million. <laughs> Um, so this is a very marginal amount of flexibility in the, uh, in the five-year tip uh, for next year. Um, yeah, so breaking it down a little bit more by uh, um, actual dollar amount and uh, number of projects. Uh, so we've got four bicycle network and pedestrian connection projects uh, for about $31 million. Um, this year was the first year uh, that we actually allocated funds to projects through our community connections program. We funded five projects there for $822,000, uh, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, and then in fiscal years 2022 through 25, uh, we also have $8 million in further funding for community connections um, that we will actually choose specific projects for uh, in future tip cycles. Um, Again, sort of, you know, Complete Streets takes up about half of our, a little bit less than half of our funding with 23 projects funded. Um, intersection improvements a little bit smaller with 11 of those projects. Um, the green line is in here. Again, that's the last year of our uh, flex to, 
to the T for that specific project. Um, so we've got $27 million in the TIP um, for that, uh, and then we'll be all wrapped up. Uh, and then we do have some other major infrastructure projects that are non-transit, uh, three of them uh, for $156 million over five years. Um, and then uh, we do, much like the Community Connections program, uh, we've also held transit modernization funding uh, in fiscal year 25. Uh, and this is funding that we will come back and allocate uh, to specific projects in future years. Uh, and then you can see here, it's sort of how the funding levels relate um, to the goals that we set in the long range plan. Um, we're pretty close on everything uh, overall. Uh, you can see that we're slightly over-programmed on major infrastructure, uh, which is actually okay because um, we're under-programmed on transit modernization. Um, that sounds like a bad thing, but really it's just because transit modernization is only one year in um, to its funding because this is the first year of that program. And so as we add year-over-year -year funding for transit modernization, um, that this will tick up by about a percent every year and we'll get to our to our five percent goal. Um, so uh, that project is, or that program rather, is, is on track uh, and is, you know, we're considering it sort of fully funded um, in its first year. Um, but this being a five-year picture, it, it looks a little bit smaller. Um, and then as we phase in that program, um, you know, some of that extra funding may come out of, of major infrastructure, um, but that sort of remains to, to be seen, uh, depending on how we program major infrastructure projects in future years. Um, and then just thinking about how funding is uh, allocated across the region. Uh, so we obviously have eight sub-regional groups, um, which you can see on our uh, pretty map here. Um, so we don't, um, <clears throat> you know, have a requirement per se to allocate funding, um, in, you know, by formula or anything like that uh, across our, our eight subregions or across, you know, all 97 municipalities in the region. Um, but we do try our best to make sure that we're meeting the needs um, of the entire region. Um, and so we uh, look at metrics like the ones displayed here, things like the percent of population in each subregion. Uh, the percent of jobs, and then the percent of federal aid roadway miles. Um, this just helps us get a sense of, you know, how close we are to, um, to kind of meeting the, you know, a sort of, you know, roughly like reasonable distribution of, of funding across the, the whole region. Um, you know, this being a five-year snapshot, uh, it is a little bit sensitive to uh, projects that are added in the fifth year or that come out of, you know, sort of year zero in the tip. So projects that are actually going to advertisements. Um, so in this case, I did want to flag that Metro West uh, and WRC, uh, you know, their level of funding looks really low relative to the, these other metrics, uh, but they just had, uh, they have a $20 million project in fiscal year 20 that's going to advertisements here probably in the next couple of weeks. That's the Palm Street project in, in Ashland. Um, and so because that project has moved out of our five-year band, uh, their funding looks really low, but, you know, if you were to zoom out over a longer time period, that would even out. Uh, and then, you know, the same sort of theme, uh, but in the opposite direction for uh, NS NSPC, which is the North Suburban Planning Council. Uh, they just had a $16 million complete street project in Woburn added in 2025 uh, this year. So that makes their, you know, makes their funding jump up a little bit. Uh, a little bit higher, uh, but again, this being sort of a, a snapshot, uh, you know, these things fluctuate year to year. But generally speaking, you know, we're uh, we're certainly getting funding out to the to the whole region. Um, you know, you all are familiar with this, but I did just want to highlight that we do, uh, you know, think about all of our investments in terms of how they meet our performance measures. Um, so we can sum these slides out afterwards, and, and this graphic is also in the tip, um, so you can look at it in more detail later. Uh, this is in chapter four. Again, it's our, our big performance measure chapter. Um, but we do think about everything from how many bridges we're rehabbing to, um, you know, the amount of vehicle delay that we're reducing, um, you know, the amount of CO2 that we're projected to, to pull, you know, or sort of, you know, reduce uh, by any given project. And so, um, you know, we are thinking about these bigger picture metrics of how collectively our investments are impacting the region. 
Um, so again, check out chapter four of the tip if you are you know, interested in sort of the, the nuts and bolts of, of all of these numbers. Uh, and then just, I do just want to wrap up by flagging the, the eight new projects that we funded this year. Uh, so uh, we funded the three highest scoring projects uh, in each uh, investment program, um, largely because we did have quite a bit of limited fund or, you know, very limited funding. Um, and so we wanted to just sort of, you know, invest in, in the highest scoring projects by our criteria. Uh, so these projects here, uh, Woburn Common, a uh, complete streets project in Woburn, um, an intersection project uh, at Route 3 and Bedford Road uh, in Burlington and Woburn, uh, and then the another segment of the Independence Greenway uh, in Peabody uh, were the three, the three projects that we funded um, in each of these investment programs. Um, and then, as I mentioned, this is also our pilot round of the Community Connections Program, um, and those this funding was allocated in 2021. Um, and these are the five projects that we funded there. Uh, so we have two uh, transit signal priority projects, uh, one in Davis Square and one on Concord Avenue uh, in Cambridge. Uh, we're funding um, a shuttle service in Newton, uh, some bike shelters on the Bruce Room and Rail Trail in Concord, uh, and then uh, some marketing funding for a carpool program to help connect folks with the commuter rail station in Sharon. Uh, so those were the, the pilot round uh, funded projects for community connections. And then as I mentioned, we've also uh, held funds for transit modernization in 2025. Uh, and then just a couple quick notes and we will open up to the discussion. Um, you know, we did have a lot of cost increases this year, which really limited our, our flexibility in funding new projects. Um, and several of those, uh, you know, a majority of those cost increases were pretty sizable, over a million dollars a piece. Um, and so that's something that we'll be coming back to the MPO to talk about, uh, we believe, later this summer. Um, and, you know, certainly something that we're hoping to address in the project selection process going forward, um, because, you know, nobody is, is super excited about um, ending a, a tip cycle with only a handful of projects chosen. Um, because of limited funding. So we obviously want to, you know, program as many projects as possible and that, you know, includes a need to uh, control costs for, uh, for already programmed projects. Um, and as a result of those cost increases, a bunch of projects got pushed out. So 13 projects got moved into later years. Uh, again, that's an outcome that we really want to avoid. Municipalities work really hard getting their projects, uh, you know, ready to go in their, their programmed year. And we, you know, want to do our best to to not have to move those around. Um, but you know, there are only so many dollars available in, in any given year, and so uh, the downside of that is that um, as costs go up, projects have to move out, and um, that's certainly was a major takeaway from this year. Uh, and then, you know, also to balance things out, we did uh, split some of our larger projects over multiple years. Um, which uh, helped us, you know, zero out the, the budgets. But, um, you know, again, it's something we would rather avoid if, if we can. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, I will, you know, be obviously available to take any questions on the presentation, but then I know you all want to talk about um, your public comment letter and that can be available for questions on that as well. Yeah, I think we're going to need to go to the letter, but Franny had her hand up. So we'll take Franny's question and then we'll turn it over to Chris to talk about the, the letter. Franny, I think you can talk. Hi. Hi. Yes. I'm, I'm in the woods trying to get exercise while being at this meeting. Um, so I was wondering, in some of these, a lot, all these projects, how are they, how set in stone are they? If due to COVID or due to following some other pathway, such as somehow moving quicker on the, um, if we move quicker on the rail vision, for example, and um, suppose we want to, you know, I'm listening to the um, signal changes on the rail rate which you probably need anyway, even if you do electrified vehicles. But I'm just wondering, are, are all of these, um, this is a more broad question, not about a specific project. Is there flexibility as we move forward? If we decide 
either due to COVID or due to other projects um, coming forward to make sea changes to our plans. Um, is, are, can we easily sort of morph these into other spending that's more appropriate with the changed plans? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. Uh, I guess the short answer is that, uh, I mean, the MPO as a you know, decision-making body always uh, every year has agency over what to, what to fund and what not to fund in the TIP. Um, so while the TIP is you know, a five-year five -year plan, um, nothing that is uh, programmed in the TIP in any given year is fully set in stone until it actually happens. Um, you know, so the MPO always has prerogative to um, to change its investment strategy. Uh, that being said, historically, uh, the MPO has you know once a project uh, has funding allocated to it in the TIP, um, you know unless something changes on the availability of funding, uh, you know the MPO does try to honor its commitments um, again because you know a lot of these projects have been the recipients of, you know, hundreds of thousands or potentially into the millions of dollars in municipal funds for design and um, permitting and like all that kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, and so, you know, the MPO committing funding in 2023 for projects uh, is a signal to a municipality that, um, you know, they can continue to make investments on their side to move the project forward. Um, and so the MPO generally has not removed projects uh, that it's already chosen to program. Um, but that's, you know, not out of the question. I mean, it, it's, you know, always a, a possibility. Um, that being said, I mean, we do hope that, you know, municipalities and consultants who are designing these projects um, are taking into account the changing landscape, uh, you know, due to COVID and due to, you know, climate change or any other sort of bigger picture uh, shocks or stressors to the system and you know we do um, if that changes a project design along the way or, or something like that I mean I think we encourage uh, you know municipalities and designers to be to be thoughtful in that way um, but yeah so I hope that answers your question and I guess I was I wasn't thinking necessarily of just municipalities but just you know the overall picture but I think you covered that you know if the MPO, you know, helps us go for more federal funding toward linking north and south and or um, electrifying. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we don't slug along in another direction just because we're used to it. But it sounds like you are flexible. So, so we're, we're going we're gonna to have to move on uh, because the, uh, the agenda has us ending by 410. He, although we have allotted you know, 105 minutes, so I'm going to go to 415. I'm going to drop the chair's comments, me, but I really want to give Chris as much time as he wants to talk about the 3C letter because we have to get that um, to the MPO by the 21st. Me, so, Anna Christina, we just ask you to wait. You'll go first after Chris talks about um, the letter, and we'll try to get this meeting done by 415. Chris? Hey Matt, is there any chance I can share my screen? Uh, yeah, I will stop screen sharing. Sorry, I was muted for all of that. You should be able to <laughs> share your screen. Okay, great. Now I just have to find the right application. Um, all right, let's get that out of there. Okay, um, I'm just pulling up kind of a draft of talking points for the, uh, the comment letter and the tip. Uh, the 3C commit committee met a little bit earlier today and, and um, we also met back in March and we had a kind of a meeting on the preliminary project selection or evaluation results. Um, so, uh, uh, so we had, a, I guess we had just a, um, a few key points uh, and uh, uh, so first of all, uh, you know, we do, so I guess the first, you know, recognizing that there wasn't a lot of um, new funding to allocate in the fiscal year 2025, um, and that a lot of the projects that TIP are basically, you know, continuing or completing 
uh, what we've committed to funding already. So, um, uh, you know, with that said, which we'll go back to, um, you know, we do appreciate the fact that um, the MPO has really worked to achieve the funding targets that um, kind of the goal of that was to move away from just spending money on large projects and especially large highway projects or even transit projects and kind of increasing the amount of funding on smaller projects and that we're hitting that 45 percent target for complete streets projects. Um, uh, the second point uh, is that uh, the community, community connections program is something that you know now we have something specific to look at. I mean it looks like some good and interesting projects for not a lot of money so we're um, looking forward to seeing the results of those and, and funding more projects on that. Um, you know, we do agree uh, with the, uh, uh, for the 2025, uh, we, I think we initially saw a list of at least a dozen projects that were scored. Um, you know, unfortunately we were only able to pick three of those, um, but uh, we did pick three from the highest, uh, the highest scoring projects, in, one in each funding category for the bike pad, commute, complete streets and intersection projects. So we felt that was a reasonable approach. Um, and then also there were, we had some questions. Um, the Grath Highway project was one of the ones that was scored and not brought in to the 2025 tip. Um, uh, and uh, I think I think we generally support that project as it's it's a major project, but it also has you know good community benefits and it does you know complete streets as well as sort of a major highway reconstruction or deconstruction, I guess. Um, but uh, we understand, uh, I mean, the R Rutherford Avenue is also in there. We're finishing off that project. So, you know, we don't want to put too much into major, uh, large projects at one time again. So, um, and, you know, that if that, you know, receives consideration in 2026, we um, once wanted to reiterate the support for that project. Um, and then finally, getting to this issue of cost increases and uh, just kind of noting that we're a little concerned about that. and. Um, uh, and there may be probably legitimate reasons for a lot of the cost increases, but I think, you know, having it at one estimate and then, you know, with all of them all coming back later and increasing the costs and it kind of uh, means you're not able to meet expectations uh, and uh, you, need, you need to shift projects back and, um, and maybe if you'd had sort of a more realistic estimate in the beginning, you could look at um, uh, you might evaluate the projects differently, or you might look at um, additional funding sources. Um, so, you know, we had a few questions, you know, can the MPO and or MassDOT provide, you know, incentives or resources to, you know, support better cost estimation in the early stages of the project. So you're building in the appropriate contingencies, uh, that sort of thing. And, um, uh, you know, if it's something where it's clear to the communities that, uh, you know, if they really come in with a underestimate that that might require, um, require delaying or deprioritizing the, the project and just wanting more information about how MassDOT looks at the reasonableness of costs. Um, second, you know, is it possible to find efficiencies through value engineering for some of the larger projects, um, you know, like we did for the Green Line, you know, that may or may not be feasible, but, you know, it's just something to look at. Um, and then the third is the um, uh, can, uh, you know, would like to continue maybe moving towards some sort of cost effectiveness metrics in terms of benefits per dollar, which might help um, kind of going back to that upfront assessment of, of which projects are most worthwhile and, you know, in addition to or sort of combined with the scoring criteria that we have already. Um, so those are sort of the, uh, I guess, the uh, common points that we came up with. Um, if anybody has other points that we should be making or you know, wants to disagree with any of these or, or revise or tweak them, um, you know, certainly take input on that now. Okay, we'll take um, Anna Christina now. I'll unmute her. I, I tried, it's not working for some reason. Oh, there she goes. Oh, here I am. Um, I'll be really quick. This actually touches upon John's and Franny's and Chris's points, but I was hoping that this is more for Matt. Did he, or did he already leave? I doubt it. Um, well, is there any way we can see the tip prioritized not by scoring value, but actually by shovel readiness? Because all these projects that are 
getting pushed to the side. I mean, the longer you push something back, if it went through a study phase, things are going around. It's, the cost is going to balloon the further out it goes. And I'm wondering if we can see how past conceptual phase is an actual project rather than anything else. I mean, is there any way we can see that just to see it? Because that might help answer some of these questions as far as, you know, the cost effectiveness perspective that, that Chris was pointing out. Yeah, uh, I think it's a really good question um, and certainly one that, uh, you know, we've been thinking about on the staff level as well. Uh, so generally when we're looking at projects to program, uh, I mean, one of the many data points we bring to the MPO on, on each project is its current design status, you know, whether it's uh, just been approved by the MassDOT Project Review Committee, but hasn't really advanced beyond that in MassDOT's design, or if it's at 25%, 75% design, et cetera. Um, in years past, uh, when we were funding fewer larger projects, uh, we generally asked, uh, you know, cities and towns to submit projects for consideration when they were at 25% design. Uh, I think now that we're, you know, the last couple of years, at least, you know, in my relatively short experience, um, you know, now that we've been moving in a direction where uh, we're funding, a, you know, a higher number of, of smaller projects. Um, and also, I mean, we all know that, you know, municipal budgets are constrained and um, and all of that. I mean, we're generally seeing projects earlier in the design process. Um, and, you know, the upside to that is that we can give municipalities more certainty that, you know, if they continue through, basically that, that they'll have, you know, actual capital funding before they spend a lot of money on design. But um, the downside is that as designs change, then, you know, costs can change as well. Um, so we do have some of that information, but uh, there are, you know, significant trade-offs with how we approach that. Um, and like this, this year, only like maybe two out of the 17 projects that we looked at were at 25% design and everything else was, was earlier than that in the design process. Yeah, I mean, 25% design, I mean, I have worked on a lot of 30, 60, 90 design and 25%, I mean, your changes in cost from 25 to like 60 are ridiculous. So I'm wondering if we can informally see the level of design already or study or, any, you know, I think it should be beyond 25% to even be really programmed. I mean, there's people, like I said, that have, they're closer to being shovel ready now. So if something does happen where I don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic and funding and everything else, but wouldn't it be wiser to invest in things that are a little bit more completed, <laughs> you know, beyond? I know it's, it's hard sometimes when you're talking right away and everything else, but all that changes also from 30 to 60%. So I just think 25% is a gamble. It's just a gamble. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. You, you made your point, you know, and I hear it, and, and I'd love to talk about it more, but we're just kind of running out of time. We can okay. come back to it. We can come back to it, you know, but I want to see what Andrew has to say, and I want to make sure that everyone has, to, has a chance to comment on the preliminary version or, or the outline of the 3C letter, because we've got to make that a priority. Um, Andrew? Um, yeah, so I think one thing that um, I think the MPO has done really well is considerations of um, social equity um, in the transportation system. And so I think um, just on a quick read of it, like I, I do think that um, in the comment letter should be, you know, appreciation and in, in that the MPO continues to invest time and effort in, in looking at those kind of questions and trying to think about how you actually measure it, because it is one of the hardest things to do as a former MPO staff member and as a current city uh, employee, it is really um, an incredible task to even try to think about the question. And so the fact that the MPO is investing the time to you know, come up with ways of measuring it is, is I think really um, worthwhile. 
um, to just note. I, you know, I think we can all question about whether it's the right measures or things like that, but the fact that there's even something on the page is something that I think should be acknowledged and, and really, um, in this case, praised, because uh, it's a hard question. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that completely. Yeah, I think, am I muted still? No. Okay, great. So, so I, I was looking at another screen. Yeah, and so sometimes it takes a little while to navigate back to uh, where I can access the controls. So, uh, uh, Matt, can you tell me if someone else has their hands up? Not at the moment. Not at the moment. And uh, so, Chris, you want to say anything? Um, no, I've just I've just added the two points that we talked about, um, and other than that. Uh, we're going to be actually, you know, putting this into a letter format and uh, sending it in before the uh, public comment deadline. All right. So then I can come back to Anna Christina. Did you want to expand more or or say more about your point? Because what I will say is that a uh, when it came to amending the temp, you know, moving things me from the twenty one, you know, to twenty two or twenty three, the uh, readiness was a big factor in deciding what projects got moved in and 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 so that the is is as you approach the time that the project is going to start the that is predominant in terms of the, the decision making process and some things get moved back because they're not ready and some things get moved forward because they are ready sooner than uh, originally planned uh, if you're saying, though, that they shouldn't even be considered in the tip until they've reached a certain level of design, I hear you on that. I mean, one thing I'm concerned about, though, is that there are some small communities that just don't have the wherewithal I mean, to really do, uh, do design. Because yeah. that's, that's expensive, I mean, and maybe we can try to allocate some monies for them to, to do that. I mean, but, I mean, yeah, if... if, if a pre-complete streets program. Yeah. No, I just wanted to know if we could see the tip based on what level of completion it's at, like informally, yeah. just for us to see. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm wondering, is it possible, I mean, could the MPO score projects early on just to give people a sense of where they stand, um, but then not necessarily fund them until the design is further developed to so sort of like you come, you come to the MPO with a pre 25% design, um, you know, the MPO gives you a preliminary scoring and then, oh geez, if you score well, maybe it's, it's worth putting some more money into design. And if you're not, not scoring well, then you kind of need to go back and work on it or something. I don't know. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. Oh. That is a good idea. That's an Just idea. allocate some money towards the study, at least the study phase of what they would like to accomplish. Uh, well, this it's could fit change anyway. And this could fit into the whole um, cost benefit analysis uh, that the MPO is undergoing and uh, uh, it's exploring how to, how, I guess, whether and how to apply that to what we do. But uh, Matt can correct me uh, or expand on this. But, but I think in Virginia, or wherever it was, the, the state actually controls the, the development process being and so because it has a big influence on the development process the it has more say if things go above cost being and, and and so that's how they do some level of enforcement but i'm beginning to get a little muddy on my explanation because my understanding is a little weak so if matt wants to say more about that now's the time uh, yeah, no, uh, Len, I think you're you're generally on track there that, yeah, Virginia's process is pretty, uh, yeah, I mean, they have a, a hard limit at 10%, I, th I believe it's a 10% increase in cost, and if your project goes over that, uh, then they sort of kick you out of the program and you have to start back at square one. Um, that is obviously not something that we've done here in this region, um, but it has produced a, uh, we'll call it a high degree of compliance <laughs> among project proponents in Virginia. Um, that's one approach that we've discussed uh, at the MPO, but I'm not sure what the appetite is for pursuing something that's that rigid. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I do think the idea of, of sort of draft scoring projects earlier uh, is really compelling. Um, you know, I think maybe one other sort of nuance that I would raise here just to add to the conversation is that the difficulty with the tip is that it's, you know, 
we're programming projects five years out. And so it's difficult to tell a municipality, you should get your project like almost fully designed, get it funded for five years from now, and then just wait. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I think over that five year time period, the needs of the municipality may change, et cetera. And so they may end up redesigning anyways, because, you know, the design they came up with five years ago and then put on the shelf while, while they waited for their fiscal year to come up, like might, you know, change might be needed. So I, I think that's the hard part of doing a, a five year plan. Um, okay. and so I would just flag that. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there's a lot to, to, to talk about here. And, and so uh, try and take some notes right after this meeting. So to bring them up uh, later on, uh, we're running out of time. And, and what I definitely want to discuss is whether or not we want to make uh, our um, meetings available by audio. And so I saw the hands up and we'll come back to you, but I want the group to make a decision about whether or not we want to make the audio available on the website. I would guess a day or two after the meeting. So if there are, um, um, let's say if there are objections, let's have the hands up on those right now. So Anna Christina has her hand up. I don't have an object. I'm sorry, I don't have an objection. I just wanted to apologize for getting kicked off and agree with Matt, it is a gamble, but it'd be nice to be able to address it. So objections to making our um, meetings available by audio. One positive of this is that I know that the the minutes have been delayed. Eight, and so I had thought myself that it'd be good to have the audio. The MPO uh, has audio and I don't know if these will be indexed, eight, uh, but the MPOs I think are indexed. And so I think they're a great way to just go back and, and at least review what was in the meeting. Uh, and if you weren't there, well, it'd be a way to to live it, live it yourself. Um, all right, well, no objections, so we'll, we'll go for it with that. And one other thing I wanted to point out in the letter that I sent to some of you all, well, David has his hand up. David? Yeah, um, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I guess I would just say from my perspective, I don't see them as particularly useful um, replacement as for minutes, because uh, the benefit of the minutes is a quick reference point and um, but I, I'm fine with having the recording on the record. It just, I'm not gonna go sorting through hours of, of meeting stuff audibly to, to find something. No, I, I hear you, I understand. And I, I agree completely. And, and if they are indexed, it does make it easier to, to go to you know, that point in the conversation. But no, no, it's def definitely not a, a, a replacement, but sometimes when, when we know the minutes are gonna be delayed, I mean, and so we were having problems with the minutes before COVID and now, I'm sure this just kind of mucked things up even more. So, so at least it'll be something. And uh, so, um, and the last thing I just wanted to point out was what I sent to some of you all uh, in letting you know about the MPO meeting tomorrow is that there is a discussion about how to redefine what a uh, um, major infra infrastructure project is. And, and, and so there have been a couple of cases in the last cycle where the cost of a project, like a complete street project, has gone up above $20 million, and that's shifted it to the major infrastructure category. And were we then to look at how we are meeting our goals, it would then imply that we are programming way more major infrastructure projects than we had said we would. So there's going to be discussion about whether we should increase the the threshold in which that happens, or if a program is is cast categorized in a certain category, even if it goes to less cost, it stays in that category. So uh, there's a link to the presentation that Anne is going to give on the MPO's website. I suggest you check that out if you want to give me some input on um, your thoughts about it. Uh, please feel free to do so. I'll, I, I'll, I'll be able to take your email right up until the point that that comes up in the agenda. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, so any other new business from anyone else? Um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we were all set on uh, this comment letter. And um, I just, I wasn't sure if we should potentially have a vote to, you know, sort of empower Chris to draft a letter based off of these points that he's written down uh, for submitting to the MPO. Yes, we should. I got ahead of myself. Thank you very much. And, no worries. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so um, 
I would say let's formalize it a little bit. If someone wants to make a motion, we'll take a motion. And, and if you could make a motion by raising your hand and I'll unmute you. All right, John. So moved. Anna Christina. A second. Okay. Okay, so on the motion to, well, hold on. Um, so, so um, Matt, are we gonna have to do a voice or could I maybe shortcut this and say if there are I, any I objections, we, raise your hand? Uh, yes, I think we can shortcut it that way. Okay, so on the motion to accept uh, the outline that Chris has proposed for the draft three C letter, the motion was made by John uh, McDonald and uh, seconded by Anna, I'm sorry, your name's not up there, Christina. Christina, um, Franco, uh, uh, so um, is there any objections? I lost my screen. I any see none. None? Okay, there are no objections. We're all set. Thank you, guys. Uh, and um, I guess um, anything else? All right, so can I, um, we'll do this, we'll do this in a month. Anna Christina? I just wanted to know if you think we're gonna meet by next month with the correct social distancing and masks and all that, or if you wanna continue on a Zoom schedule for now. I'm assuming that we're gonna be continuing on a Zoom schedule for now. Okay. Yeah, you know, so, but I'm sure there'll be plenty of notice being enough on if, if we change things, but I know that yeah, but thanks for asking. Uh, so, well, thanks for joining, folks. And, uh, I thought it was a, a good meeting and appreciate everyone's participation. John? As, as always, wonderful job, man. Thank you. Thank you. So, so um, can we get a motion to um, end this fun party?